Hello everyone and welcome to this edition of Money Matters. I'm Ann Baldwin of Baldwin Media Marketing and on this program we are talking finally about spring. When the snow finally thaws there's going to be a flurry of activity as buyers in the market are looking for new homes and start digging out from winter. We can see that happening already. So if you're someone or someone you know who's eager to get into the spring real estate market to buy a home, here's a discussion you won't want to miss. There's a lot to know when considering this major decision and we are fortunate to have with us on this program Matt Morell, who's the Vice President and Home Loan Sales Manager for Simsbury Bank. Matt, welcome back to the program and Thank you, finally Anne. We can see some light at the end of the winter, should we say. Yeah. So how's it looking out there? I mean, I think we're all feeling the spring fever, time to dig out and maybe look at new buying opportunities. Yeah, how's it looking? The sun is shining and that's the best thing that we can see out of our windows. It's true, Anne. It's been a long winter. And in the housing market, those of us who are in it, when we, when we see a lot of snow and frigid cold temperatures, most importantly, people don't want to get out and about. We tend to hibernate, just right. like the animals do. Um, so it's been a long winter in, the, in the, the market for homes. People have delayed listing their homes for fear that people won't come out and see them. And certainly buyers have spent more time indoors than spending their Sunday afternoons traveling around. The good news and your suggestion that there is a light at the end of the tunnel is I actually myself was out and about Sunday and visiting open houses just yeah. to, to get a temperature of the no pun intended, of what's been going on out there. And there were five or six cars at every home at the time that I That's stopped great. with them. And that is great for someone who, who, you know, for 16 years have watched this cycle. Um, I know the signs. And, you know, when you start to see cars parked at curbs again, the crocuses aren't far away. So we're very excited about that. And we hope that this is a really vibrant spring market because, quite frankly, over the last couple of years, um, the market hasn't been as active as we'd hope. You know, one of the things, though, that um, I'm interested to ask you about, because I know that, you know, at Simsbury Bank, you work very closely with realtors. Uh, but people, you can't assume, are always in this area buying the home. You might have folks out in Arizona that are coming in for job opportunities or, or whatever. So with even, you know, you can't be too territorial about the market being just Connecticut. It really does go beyond that. And with MLS listings and the Internet, yeah. um, you, you know, is it is that a right decision to say, well, it's cold here. So let's not put this house on the market yet. No, it probably isn't. You know, exposure is great. The trouble is, you know, the market has become such that listings do get stale. Mm. And what happens is if someone sees that a listing has been on the market for several weeks or a month and a half or so, then prospective buyers say, all right, what's wrong? Why isn't anyone else interested in this house? So I think that consumers and people looking to list their home are conscious of that. Mm -hmm. And maybe the realtors are kind of saying to them, you know, maybe this isn't the best time if, if the conditions aren't right. Because you don't want a, a house to get stale dated. It tends to hurt. Um, but you're right. You know, the, the adage of location is everything in real estate. Well, it is for the home that someone's looking to sell or buy. But the purchasers are no longer local. They are in ours. They are in other places of the mm -hmm. country, and um, that's why we all advertise on the internet now. And folks right. looking to move into Connecticut are folks that we want to reach. Um, so it's always a good time to buy or sell a house, but certainly when there's four feet of snow outside, exactly, it's, it's not. It's a little bit of a deterrent, isn't right. it? It sure is. So we've had some change in laws. We've had some change, and it seems like it's getting a little bit. Uh, more difficult for people to qualify. So, you know, from a community bank perspective, what is your advice for folks if you're looking now to get into the uh, new home market mm -hmm. or if you're maybe going to upgrade and, you know, kind of move up a little bit, trade up, if you will? Right. So, we've done a couple of these shows mm -hmm. and we've talked about some of these new laws and we've right. also talked about first time home buyers and what they should do in the past. But the message can, you know, you can never say it enough. Right. Um, and what we really like to talk about pre-spring as we are right now, is what people should do um, to put themselves, to get their ducks in a row. So there's a lot of techniques and strategies that a first-time home buyer should be thinking about even if they aren't ready to go out this Sunday and, and look for homes. Um, so most importantly, what we always tell people, and community banks are great for getting advice on this kind of stuff, so we always are willing to talk to someone, no charge to do so. Um, we want people to kind of quiet their situation. They need to stay put. Um, it's not a great time to change jobs if you're looking to get into the housing market. It's not a great time to start moving finances around if you don't need to when you're looking to buy a home. Those are all things that when we underwrite a file, we're really looking for a certain level of stability. Mm -hmm. um, so the first time home buyer especially, and even someone looking to upgrade or downsize, anyone looking to finance a transaction, um, should really just kind of settle their affairs and 
stay put is the way we talk about it. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you, if the job of your dreams falls in your lap and it's in your line of work, well, certainly we're not here to tell you you shouldn't take yeah. advantage of that opportunity, but don't be looking for something new if you know you're in the housing market just for the sake of looking for it. Just kind of stay put. Because I think it's pretty obvious, but let's just be obvious about it. So what does that, they want to see job stability. They right. want to, so how much time should you have spent at a previous employer for it to really say, okay, that's good. We always look back two years. Two, okay. Um, so if someone's been at a company for two years, it's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. If they've moved around, then we're going to look hard. And if it's in the same field or the same industry, there's usually no big issue with that. But if you've got a person who's doing one thing one day and the next day they're doing something entirely different, well, then, then the red flags start to pop up. Mm -hmm. Is it a marker? Or did they get laid off and they're just trying to pay the bills for the short term? Or, you know, are they thinking of, you know, changing their entire, their entire job um, description and two months from now, they're like, well, that was a lousy idea. You know, I, I hate what I'm doing now. Right. And now they're going to look to leave that job. So two years history is great. And if, you know, if two things are at work here. If you're changing jobs, there's got to be, it's, it has to make sense. And secondly, if you're new to your job, you don't have the two years, but you're fresh out of school and you're doing a job that you trained for. So the teacher that graduates college and has a job as a teacher, but she's only been there a year, mm -hmm. that's perfectly acceptable because clearly that's what she's trained to right. do. So those are the things we're really looking for. Okay. And this is probably also a good time not to go out and get a new car loan or add to your debt, credit card debt, right. um, whatever the case may be, so that you can show that you've got the available funds to make that purchase. Yeah. Again, quiet your situation. You know, if you go car shopping, they're pulling your credit. And every inquiry has an impact. I'm not suggesting that it ruins credit, but it has an impact. So you've got the credit situation, and then you've got the new debt, obviously, that you're weighing on yourself. And now you've got that car payment whereby you didn't before, and you might qualify easier without it. So you really don't want to go out looking. The other thing that I always like to caution people on is, you know, these no, no financing until 2018 deals that right. we see with right. furniture and whatnot. Right. Um, those aren't a great thing to get into when you're looking to buy your house because they affect your credit in a certain way. So if you're looking to furnish the new house that you're going to buy, buy the house first and okay, furnish right, it after. That's right. the moral of the story. Exactly. Yeah. Now, um, I think one of the things that I've heard from people is to start the process um, soon. You know, you might not be ready to go actually physically out, but you can use some of this colder weather, maybe some of the rainy weather, to get your ducks in a row and put your pieces together and perhaps even pre-qualify or know what it is that the bank suggests you can afford. Yeah. Is that true? It's never, ever too early, and we always say that. I don't care if you want to buy a home two years from now. Mm -hmm. Come and talk to us. Walk into Simsbury Bank, ask to talk to a mortgage loan advisor, and talk to us because you can avoid mistakes that you can fix now rather than waiting till the nth hour. You know, if you've never seen your credit, but I pay my bills all the time. I know I'm a good credit risk. Well, you don't know what's on your credit right. report. Maybe there has been some malfeasance that you need to be aware of and take care of. Or maybe, you know, you've never used credit and you think that makes you a good credit risk. Mm. Well, if we can't see a behavior, you're not any better a risk than someone who has bad credit, quite frankly. So those are things that we always counsel people about. Um, it's really, really important that you just figure out where where your finances are now and what you should be looking to do in the future, it's, even if it's way, way off. Um, it's never it's never a burden to us to update your situation or to take another look or, or any of that stuff. But what's worse is someone comes in, they go out to look for a house tomorrow, they find the home of their dreams, we pull their credit, they want to close in 30 days, and you know, there's some credit card that they paid off in college that was never reflected appropriately in that credit report. Right. Now they're starting from scratch to fix this, and it could blow the entire deal. Right, because somebody else may be more prepared right. and uh, jump in ahead of you. So, right. and doesn't that also play into a fact, uh, play into this as well? In that, if somebody's already pre-qualified and they've been through the bank process, then the the home seller knows that mm -hmm. and the realtor knows that usually right so that makes you more of a candidate to grab something that's probably not going to last on the market very long yeah if i'm selling a house mm -hmm. and i have two people come that are very interested in it right. and one of them has done the due diligence that we're describing this morning and one of them has not i don't care if this person's offer is richer i may very well go with the person who i know can get the financing I see. as opposed to taking a chance you know personal experience my father just sold my childhood home 35 years on long island we, we've owned the home and he just closed on it about three Fridays ago. 
And um, he was telling me about he had multiple offers. And the couple that he accepted was someone who was totally pre-qualified by the bank that he actually uses as well. So he trusted their advice. And it wasn't the highest offer. Mm -hmm. But they had done their homework. They had done their due diligence. And he rewarded them for that by accepting their offer. And I can't stress that enough. It costs nothing to come and get a pre-qualification from us. And now you're armed and dangerous right. with that letter. And you can move on something very quickly. Right. And you also know what it suggested that you can afford. So you know right. what price range to start looking at. Yeah. So let's jump to that if okay. we could. Sure. Um, you know, the other really important thing that we like to, and the reason why you should come and talk to us early in the process, is very few people, especially young home buyers, really have a handle on their budget. Mm. They haven't needed to. You know, they have good jobs if that's the case, and they, they have, you know, extra money to do the things they enjoy doing. Um, but that also means that they don't really know what a mortgage payment looks like in their life. A lot of folks come to us and they say, well, I pay $1,600 in rent and I don't know how I can pay a dollar more. And then we run the numbers and we decide what $1,600 will qualify them for when we consider real estate taxes and we consider homeowners insurance and we consider perhaps PMI insurance if they put a low down payment. And all of a sudden they're like, well, geez, I can't get nearly the house I thought I could for $1,600. Now that doesn't mean that they can't shop for a more expensive house because in most cases they've sold themselves short with that $1,600. They haven't thought about the fact that $1,600 in rent is very different than $1,600 in a mortgage payment. For one thing, their lifestyle will change. They will start eating in the kitchen that they now own. Mm -hmm. They won't be going out as much. Plus, they have a tax advantage. So the $1,600 in rent gets them no tax advantage. The $1,600 or more in mortgage payment gets them money in their pocket in the form of a tax refund. So it's an entirely different world. Right. And we have people come in to us and say, this is my rent. That's what I can afford. Oh. You know, their reaction to how much house they can buy is, is, is very, very uncomfortable for them. But then we say, well, what is your income and what debts do you have? And then we tell them, you know what, you, you really can afford $2,200. Now, we're not trying to pigeonhole them into spending more than they, want to, than they want. It's just that they don't have a realistic idea of what a budget's all about. So that kind of counseling, for one, is a, is a lot of fun for us because that's fun. Mm -hmm. And it helps them really achieve their goals. Okay, great. Well, again, uh, Matt Morell from Simsbury Bank, this is, this is great advice. And I think another thing that people need to understand is that, you know, there is a professional team working with you when it comes to making that decision to become a first-time home buyer. So um, you're in good hands or you need to make sure that you're in good hands, which is also um, some advice that I'd like you to talk about. Who are the people that make sure that you get through the process and aren't they really there looking out for the best interest of the first-time home buyer? Yeah, the best part of that, Anne, is it's a team that you hire mm. as the customer. And people don't realize, you know, people don't realize you that. You have a say in that. Right. And you should hire the people that you trust. So, you know, there are a lot of people that touch a transaction. There's your lender, mm -hmm. Simsbury Bank. There's your realtor. There's your home inspector. There's your attorney. Okay. There's your insurance provider. So those are the top fives, five. And those are all people that you hire to work on your behalf. And you should, quite frankly, interview them like you would someone that you were hiring. Um, I always say that start with your lender because if the numbers don't work, none of the other people matter. Right. Right. So if you go to a lender that you trust, preferably us, but if not, someone that you have a relationship with and that you trust, then that person might be able to point you in the direction. We refer people to realtors all the time, not because there's any financial impact to us or any benefit to us, but because we want this to be an easy, successful transaction for you as well, because right. that makes our lives easier. Right. So we know the folks in the, in the industry who are doing business the way that we think they should be doing it. Um, so build that team around you. And by the way, that team can be your life's team. I mean, you know, you'll need a realtor other times in your life. You'll need an attorney now that you own a home to draft a will and to mm -hmm. start getting your affairs in order. You'll need a good insurance person to satisfy your other insurance needs now that you're a homeowner and you have some other risks. So this is your team of professionals and they should be your team and you should hire them. So we always prefer that you start with the lender, but if you don't, just make sure you have it in, the, in, in your mind that you need competent people and you can work with who you want. You know, and it's so important, I think, that uh, you also understand that this is really a relationship.
You know, you're, you know, you may be the bank, they may be the lawyer, you may be the realtor, but this is a very emotional decision for most people. And maybe one of the biggest decisions that you make in your life. Yeah. So you've got to make sure too, that you've got that, you know, that the personality fits, that the approach fits, that, you know, I know for me, when I years ago bought my first home, that was very important to me because there are emotions that go with this. I may be sitting there filling out my application and you tell me some, uh, you know, I remember crying at times. Yeah. I remember being, you know, excited static when when we finally were qualified and and walked through the door in the threshold of our first home and our realtor was there for that so yeah. they share in this life moment with you um, some happy some sad and so that relationship piece to me is also one that I think people don't necessarily think about yeah let's face it unless you're buying and selling businesses several times in your life or you know you're financially well off and you buy an airplane this is probably the largest financial transaction 90% right. of us will ever have mm. And if you've never done it before, you know, you can get all sorts of misinformation. I mean, just Google first time home buyer and you'll see how varied the information can be. So what you're saying is exactly right. You know, it's not transactional by any means, no matter what, you know, certain companies on the internet or whatever might lead you to believe, it's not transactional. It's 100% relational. Um, you know, most of my loan officers make it their best effort to be at that closing. Now we have no role at that closing. By the time you get to the closing table, Everything has been buttoned up, the check is there, and, and everything is done. There's no physical role for us, but there's that emotional component that we just helped you for however long, a month and a half in the shortest and three years in the longest, if you're doing what we suggest you do this morning. And there's got to be some closure there. Right. And God forbid you do have that question at the closing table that is financing related. We don't want you to have to go leave that transactional a moment without getting that question answered. Mm -hmm. So the relationship component to this is huge. Right. And you're right, a lot of people don't see it that way. They see it as a transaction. You know, you shared the story about your father who sold your, your home on Long Island and my mother recently sold um, her condo in Colorado and bought another home. She downsized yet upgraded. Yeah. But the, the relationship piece, it reminded me of the story in that she dealt with someone, a realtor and a financial person who it was all internet. Yeah. Everything was done on the internet. She could never reach anybody. She never had any conversations. She never had any FaceTime with anybody. It was just, she said, and, and, you know, she couldn't believe that that's how it was done. And it was an awful experience for her. She needed that relationship piece to the point when she actually took over the property, uh, they had left a mess and garbage and things behind. So there was no relationship there to fall back on. Yeah. So I just know that um, it can make the, the experience so much better if you feel that you have that and that you're comfortable with it. Yeah, it's important. And you know, the thing of it is we at Sensory Bank and other banks, are, you know, we understand the millennials do business online and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So we have, you know, we but have don't to forget the relationship. Right, we piece. have to rise to that need right. where they can communicate us via email and get us documents via email and that kind of stuff. But that's just delivery. Those yeah. are delivery channels. And, and it's okay. And we can meet them where right. they do business. And in it's that not regard. old fashioned. Right. But to be able to connect with someone and know to talk yeah. to someone is really, really important. Now, the other thing is, uh, you know, a lot of people, they, well, this is what I did and this is what worked for me. Everybody yeah. wants to give the you a cooler. little, the water cooler conversation. Uh, don't do this. or because It's like having a child and everyone wants to share right. their horror stories with you. Right. So what's your advice for that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it goes back to hiring that team. Hiring people you trust and understanding, maybe you get them by referral or whatever the case may be. But once you hire that team, then you have to trust that team. Um, you know, real estate is a hot topic. My wife and I have this joke because we can't go out to dinner where I don't hear someone mention buying a house or something because most people are talking about this a lot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have this big joke where she's like, you're not even listening to me because what's going on? I'm like, oh, they're buying a house over there kind of a thing. <laughs> because everyone wants to talk about it. Right. So what happens is you get your relationship, you find the house of your dreams, you lock into your interest rate, you go into work the next day, and the guy at the water cooler says, oh, I just locked my loan at such and such a rate. Half and a point like, low and you're like, right. right. And you're like, oh. So then you call your lender. And, and the thing of it is, everybody's situation is entirely different. Number one, you don't know that they're telling you exactly the situation. You don't know if they've paid points. You don't know if they right. have better credit than you have or any of that stuff. So the fact of the matter is, do your due diligence, pick the people, and then trust the people that you work with because there's all that chatter out there. And every situation truly is different. Truly is different. Now, your lender should be able to describe for you why you're getting the rate you're getting based on the risk of the loan and your credit and the amount you're borrowing versus the purchase price. All that is important. I'm not saying go blind and just with blind faith, trust anything they say, mm -hmm. but trust the people you're working with. So as a first time home buyer, once you lock into the 
lock into the loan yep. with your lender, are you then, that is your, that's your rate. Can that change? Can you back out of that? Can it be adjusted? Um, that's a question that I, I think a lot a of lot. people have. Yeah. yeah. You know what? It's a contract. So when you lock your rate in with your lender, and that sometimes happens the very first day you apply, and sometimes it happens later in the process, depending on your situation. But once you lock the rate, you've committed, you've signed a contract to pay that rate on that money. Now, locking your rate rarely happens three days before you're closing. Mm -hmm. So usually it's a few weeks in advance. Well, during those few weeks, the market can change, things can get better, things can get worse. And the beauty of that is if they get worse, you're protected right. from having to pay a higher right. rate. It's a gamble. But if they get better, you don't mm -hmm. automatically benefit from that. Um, and that's okay because that's the way this works. If we all knew when the best day to buy a stock was, yeah. there would be no stock market right. because nobody knows that and it's a game of chance. Um, so get, trust people you work with, get the best information you can, make an educated decision at the time that, with the information you have, and then accept that you made the right choice. How long in advance of the approval process can you lock in on a rate? Let's say I haven't yeah. started doing my due diligence at all, but I know maybe five years from now, I want to buy a home and rates are low. Can I lock in today? No. no. You can't lock unless you're under contract to buy. Okay. And you can't be under contract to buy unless you've gone that far in that process. So anything prior to that is hypothetical. We can pre-qualify someone at today's current rate, um, but if they find a house two months from now, None of those numbers matter okay. unless rates haven't changed. Typically, we offer at Sinsbury Bank, we offer a 60-day rate lock on a, on a purchase. That's generous. Most that banks are 30 generous, days. Right. So you have to wait till you're much closer to mm. the end line. We give you 60 days, which means we hedge against the market moving for 60 days. Um, and that's really the outside. If someone is, is entering into a contract where they're having a house built, and they need the financing at the end of the construction process, and it's a five-month process, well, then they can buy an extended rate lock, but that all costs money because now you're hedging your bets against a longer period of time. But there's no, you know, several, several years ago, nine, ten years ago, a couple of the larger banks had a lock and shop product mm -hmm. where you could lock your rate today and then go and find your house, and as long as you close within six months, you could get that rate, but they charged you a premium for that. Mm. And all that stuff has gone away because it really was just, it was quite frankly, it was just a gimmick. It didn't do anybody any good. So your mortgage lenders and the people that work with your customers are, is it just if they're buying property here in Connecticut or do no. you go beyond? No, we are licensed in Massachusetts, Rhode Island and um, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So we can finance a home in any one of those states. It doesn't mean that the person, you know, the person um, can't live now in Texas and not buy a home in Massachusetts, we're, buy, we're putting the lien on the property in Massachusetts. Okay. So we can finance on any home in those three, in those three states. Okay, and do you need to be a banking customer no. of Simsbury Bank in order to? No, you know, we've regionalized our mortgage business over the last few years, so um, we can help anyone with or without uh, existing Simsbury Bank relationship. The good news is, with those millennials in mind, you know, Sinsbury is gravitating towards all that great internet banking and mobile check capture and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. So you could potentially live in Rhode Island where we don't have branches and get a mortgage through us and become a deposit customer, and that would be great, but you don't have to be, absolutely not. Okay, so how is the market looking? What's the forecast? And I know that you don't have a crystal no. ball. Um, we all wish you did, but you don't. Right. Um, so what is it looking like? Or should what, we be optimistic? Yes. Here's as a what, seller or as a buyer? Both. Okay. <laughs> Here's what we do know. What okay. we do know is there is pent up demand. There have been a lot more buyers over the last year and a half or so than there have been homes to buy. And any realtor will tell you that. I think I'm safe in saying. They have people that want to buy a house, but they have nothing to show them. Mm. So that being said, housing prices have started to come up. So a lot of people who have been sitting on the sidelines as far as selling goes over the past four or five years now may very well think that this is the year that they can get the price they need for their house. So those listings are going to come on the market. Buyers are waiting for those listings. So we have really, really high hopes once the snow thaws mm -hmm. that this will be a great spring and summer for real estate. You know, as many people as you ask that question, you'll hear as many different answers. But that's how we feel at Sinsbury Bank. We're very optimistic about the spring and the summer, and we're excited for it to start, quite frankly. Right. One of the things, too, that I go back again to my experience years ago as a first-time home buyer, I, I got discouraged a couple of times because I would go as a first-time home buyer thinking this is the home of my dreams and this is the one I want. And then for some reason, somebody overbid me or it didn't work out. And then, you know, just that discouragement. Yeah. And I remember one of the homes I was going to buy, my husband and I at the time were going to buy, was in West Hartford. 
and I was so excited about it, this beautiful little tutor, but it was like something out of a bad movie. It was, yeah. it, the kitchen was the bad, the bad. Yeah. it was a money pit. It was exactly that, but you know, I didn't look at it that way. Right. So you also do, you know, look around in advance of maybe even the qualification process so you know what's out there and, and have somebody that's owned a home before yeah. consult you to say, do you really think this, look at the piping, look at the electrical, look at the plaster Paris walls and ceilings. Right. I mean, you really need someone else to give you that perspective too sometimes. Yeah, and I'll tell you, there's been a shift in the buyer profile. You know, we are so busy now. The young people are so busy with their jobs and everything mm. else that a lot of people aren't looking for fixer-uppers like they did right. 20 years ago, right? right? And I think HGTV has had something to do with mm. that as well. They walk in and they, and they don't want to see potential, they want to see what they want. So it gets harder because that's not likely to happen. You're not likely to see exactly what you have in your mind's eye. So it's really important to have your list of must-haves and to have your list of negotiables. And just know that there are products in the market. We do we do construction rehab loans and things, so if mm. you find that tutor in West Hartford, and I'm here to tell you, unless you're in the higher price points, every tutor in West Hartford needs a new kitchen. Right, it's right, It's just right. the housing If style. you want the charm, and you have right. to have some sort of an imagination. Right. You know, to go in there and think everything's gonna be move-in perfect is not, well, you're, if it is, you're gonna pay for that. Right, right. So the good news is we have products that suit that need. So you can buy that house and rehab that kitchen to your liking, all with a mortgage through Simsbury Bank, ah. a rehab type loan. So see the potential, talk to your lender and your loan advisor, and find out what type of house you should be looking for. Right, and look at the neighborhood, and look at the schools, and look at the other amenities. It's not just this this brick and mortar structure that makes yeah. a home, right? You've got yeah, to look you know, beyond the old, that. The old adage, by the worst house in the best neighborhood, right. is still true, but a lot of people don't want to do that. They want to buy the perfect house in the perfect neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And that's that's selling themselves short again. And there's there's lending products to help people make that eyesore the house of their dreams. Right, and it's a work in progress. I mean, that's part of the beauty, if you ask me, yeah. of being a homeowner is you can, you don't have to worry about and painting the walls own. and make it your own. Yeah, make it fit your personality and, and uh, you know, take that on. That's just, there's no feeling like it. So right. I that's appreciate true. that. Well, Matt Morell, I want to thank you very much. Thank Any you. other final advice that you want to give our viewers or, um, if you could just tell them how they can contact you and that yeah. you will get the personal attention that you see right here. Yeah, you know, we're passionate about this. We want people to be out there buying homes. So make this the year that if you've been sitting on the sideline, you do it. And you can reach us at www.sinsrybank.com. My mortgage loan advisors are all listed there. Call any one of us and we'll help you realize your goal. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Matt you, Morell, Anne. Vice President and Home Loan Sales Manager of Simsbury Bank. This has been a great informational discussion and one that, um, as you can tell, we're both very passionate about. And hopefully it's made you realize that it does take some effort, but in the end, there is nothing like being able to own your own home. Again, if you would like more information, you can contact Mac directly. And trust me, he does answer his own phone. Mm -hmm. The number is 860-651-2093. Or for more information, you can also go to their website at simsburybank.com. Again, I'm Ann Baldwin from Baldwin Media. Thank you so much for joining us for this segment of Money Matters, and we'll see you again next time. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.